Hey guys, this is Ball, and we're going to be talking about the new ITS season, season 9, it's Treason. Just came out uh, in the last uh, day or two, and uh, people are talking about it on forums, on Facebook. Uh, I've had a couple of read-throughs of it. There are a lot of typos and errors in this document. Maybe they'll release a little errata shortly, but um, I kind of doubt it. CB aren't always on top of things when it comes to the exact minutiae, or how we, however you pronounce that word. Uh, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to have a talk through some of the significant stuff. We'll go through some of the missions. Uh, bear in mind, obviously, I haven't really played this stuff yet. It's just speculation. It's more opinionated reaction from me is what you're going to be getting here. First seven or so pages are really just uh, copy-paste really from the previous seasons. It's just how to run a good tournament and how CB want you to organize things in general. And then we've got the new scenario list. Uh, some missions are gone. Some new missions are added there. I noticed that they've added in some of the missions which were played in Tagline and in Strike Zone Wotan. They've taken out a couple of missions as well, notably the ones that have the uh, the objective rooms. They decided they don't want those anymore. Understandable. I think um, sometimes people got confused about how the doors work. Sometimes uh, people felt that they uh, favor the second uh, turn a bit too much. And uh, not, not everybody has an objective room as well, so maybe that's those are some of the reasons why they've got rid of them. But we're going to take the time to briefly talk about each of these missions. I'm not going to get into a huge amount of detail, especially since I haven't played some of them. So we're just going to be speculating about what to expect. Once we get up to about page 8 though, we start to see some new Season 9 rules. And we're going to go over some of this stuff now. So what have we got in here? Uh, kidnapping. This is where they're replacing the retro engineering cards. If I recall correctly, retro engineering is one of those ones where you've got to get an engineer or a pal bot of an engineer to their HVT and pass a willpower check, which wasn't exactly an easy objective to complete. Now what you can do instead is to kidnap their HVT by getting into case fact. You have to synchronize the civilian with your guy and just have, have them you know, captured effectively. Uh, and that can only be done by uh, models which have a particular type of rule. Um, I think it's either chain of command, veteran, or um, elite, or whatever you call it. Just going to see if I can get to um, army builder in my other browser here. We'll have a little look. Just to remind myself of, of what's what. So if you click com combine army, go over here. You'll see how some of the profiles have um, a type. Like if you look at this this point here, if I zoom in, so this is a character, obviously, because it's Shishkin. Fractar is especially trained drop troop, mercenary, especially trained support troop, line troops, and eventually, I think once we get to like the Ractorax, let's come over here. So elite troops are one of the guys who can do kidnapping. Elites are fine for this. Uh, Kornak is a character, so no. Uh, Ractorak is a veteran troop, so that's an example of, of a kidnapping, a kidnapper, veteran troop, elite troop, or chain of command. So there you go. Uh, what do I think of that? Uh, I think yeah, it's a it's a mild improvement, not a huge improvement. Um, a lot of people don't like uh, classified objectives, including me, because uh, there's a random chance element there which doesn't need to be in the game. You've already got a lot of randomness and variance from the dice rolls. You don't need to make it so that one player has a harder job uh, getting points and the other person has an easier job, just purely because of cards that were drawn. There's no, there's no intrigue there, there's no fun there, there's no skill there. With kidnapping... Um, I don't think it particularly favours any faction that I can think of, but once I analyse it a bit more, I might start to think of certain models, certain units, which are very good at completing this, and some which aren't, and maybe some factions have access to the, the, the desirable troops for completing that mission, and some don't. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just a classified card. I believe you can still swap this for Secure the HVT, which is a great option if you're going second and you can't complete your classified. Also, I assume, unless I've read otherwise, that there's uh, still a rule where you can choose one of two cards. You get dealt two, you pick the one you want, and if you don't want to kidnap them, will you take the other one? Next up, uh, designated target. So what they're changing here is they're, they're making it so that some of the HVT, well, in some missions, the HVT doesn't count as a neutral trooper. It's actually an enemy, enemy trooper, and it shoots back at you and everything, and what you can do is you can kill it. 
and uh, sometimes you get even more points for killing it by using your uh, data tracker, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But um, this is this is kind of interesting. I think the most important thing about this mechanic is that it's going to be very dependent on the kind of terrain you have. If you've got one table side where you have to deploy your HVT more than 16 inches away from your deployment edge and there's no suitable terrain to hide it behind, like if you have to put it too far up towards the middle, then it's much easier to kill. Whereas if you're lucky enough to have a table side where you can put it inside a building, or well not inside a building, you're not allowed to do that, but behind some obstacles which really keep it safe, then uh, you're at an advantage. So I'd recommend people uh, setting up terrain tables with that in mind for that, uh, that rule to be effective. Also, what you're going to start to see people doing is they'll go over and synchronize their own HVT and move it somewhere safer to stop your opponent from killing it because you're going to see some missions where all you got to do is kill the HVT and if you kill it with your, your data tracker, the specified model in your list, you get like five objective points. And it's, I think there's at least one mission, we'll have a look at them later, but I think there's at least one mission where if you do that, the best your opponent can hope for is a draw unless they actually do the same to you. So if you manage to kill their data tracker and you kill their HVT with your data tracker, keep your data tracker alive, that's pretty much the game in the bag in a lot of cases. So the des designated HVT uh, stat line here, it's just victim stats. I mean, this can't really survive anything. It's got a stun pistol, which sometimes it'll get really lucky, but most of the time it's just going to die. Designated target mid-season event. Now, let me grab the camera and let's move over here. So the player who's first in the ITS World Ranking will get the privilege of basically choosing to have their faction having an improved target. So it's got a more physical stat, I think, compared to the other one. More armor and BTS. Ugh, this, this is stupid. This is stupid because it's basically saying that everybody who plays the same faction as the person who wins this prize gets an advantage uh, through through nothing that they did and everybody else who has to play against people of that, that faction didn't have a who didn't have an opportunity to compete in the ITS world ranking um, now basically has to be up against a slightly more heavily armored designated HPT it's it's only gonna make a sliver of difference but in principle I think it's stupid they can give all kinds of other prizes to that world ranking person, right? They can give that person free models, they can give them vouchers, they can give them trophies, little patches. There's so many ways to reward that person. You know, put their name up on lights on the forums on the main page of Infinity, take a photo of them. All of that stuff is appropriate, but having it affect everybody else's play experience is not. I, I'm not going to complain about it too much because it's just a couple of extra points of armor and BTS on a model that's just going to die anyway, but in principle, it's just ridiculous. I think Corvus Belli are really stupid sometimes. Data Tracker. Okay, so this is one of the more significant changes in the treason se season. The season of treason! The Data Tracker is a high reliability operator specialized in recover and deliver missions related to sensitive information. So once both armies have completely deployed, and I assume that means putting your reserve model down as well, then you choose one of your guys to be the data tracker. And in most cases, you will have already sort of predetermined in your mind who that's going to be, because it's quite important in some missions. You cannot choose a model that uh, is in hidden deployment or marker state. I posted a, a question just uh, earlier today on the rules forum about whether an impersonator is allowed to be the data tracker um, if you optionally choose not to use mark state on your impersonator, but I think people believe that uh, because the model's capable of marker state from the outset, you can't make it a data tracker. I mean, how does that work? If you voluntarily deploy your Swiss Guard without using marker state, can it be the data tracker? I mean, I assume that it can. This, this trooper must always be on the game table as a model. Irregular troops can't be. Remotes can't be. Um, yeah, I, maybe I'm misreading that. Maybe I'm mis missing something. Anyway, what I want to say about data trackers is that uh, you can make a tag the data tracker, although quite often in some missions um, you might not want to do that. Also, a tag can be possessed, so there is that. But there are some models which are very tough 
that are like tags which aren't as vulnerable as a tag. I'm thinking the Coronted or the Sujian. Those are models with heaps of armor, three wounds, and you can put them prone behind a building somewhere. You can use them as your reserve model. So if you're trying to keep your data tracker alive, great. However, sometimes your data tracker is going to be this expendable model that you don't want it to die before it's completed its missions. You want to go and kill their designated target, in which case your data tracker might be something like a bulleteer, or might be something that can infiltrate without needing mark a state like Thrasymedes or something like that, or just something that's really strong and fast, Achilles data tracker. So I think people will have their own methods for choosing these guys, but it does add a little bit of interesting, a bit of an interesting level to Infinity that, um, for me, the jury's out a little bit. I expect that it will be a good thing. Um, I don't think it will benefit any particular faction too much, although generally the consensus is that they're trying to shift the emphasis in ITS away from camo spam. So if you're really used to playing vanilla Ariadna and taking lots of chasseurs and so forth. Um, you're still going to need a, 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 a like a, a data tracker, but then, I mean, dog soldiers make pretty good data trackers, so there you go. Um, actually, hang on a sec, irregular troops. Is, it, is, it, is a dog soldier a regular? Can't quite remember. Can we, just, we can always just look at army, army 6, but whatevs. Doesn't really matter. I'm sure there's another model which does the same job. Yeah, um, I think it's an interesting rule. Again, it's it, it, it plays a different role depending on which mission it actually is. So we'll look at them all separately. Here we go. Dog warriors are irregular, so they cannot be your data tracker. Fair enough, though. Fair enough. Ironclad. So uh, during the season, all tags have fatality level 1, which, unless I'm mistaken, means that they get plus 1 damage on their guns. Um... Fatality level 2 is where you crit on 1s, so fatality level 1 must be the extra strength, so fatality level 1, uh, here it is, fatality level 2, I wonder if that just happens to the wiki, no it can't take me to the wiki, never mind, look at the wiki later. Um, I think that's fine, um, they're trying to incrementally make tags better and better and better to the point where you see them a lot and you know you never feel too gimped by taking them. Um, traditionally, I've always made the argument that tags are prone to possession, they're prone to model filament weapons from Shinobu, they can be hit by missile launchers, they can be taken out in close combat, uh, they're very clunky, you can always ignore them and win the game, uh, but they're getting better and better and better. Uh, what's happening now is that they're also getting these benefits where you can deploy further in some missions, they've got the plus one uh, strength now on their gun, uh, they do have specialists inside them. I think tags are really viable. Uh, I I don't think that I would favor most tags over other options at this point still, but they're getting better and better. And this is uh, w one thing I do approve of is that Corvus Belly seem to be just making incremental improvements to them. It's better than um, improving them too much and then having to weaken them too much and just having this knee jerk reaction both ways. Um, I've always favored uh, in terms of wargaming companies and computer games and strategy games in general, the people who are designing these games, I, I do like the incremental improvements towards um, a, like a perfect balance uh, rather than just doing these large swings in, in power level. Reduced combat groups I think is a real big deal. So um, since Limited Insertion came out, um, there have been a lot of people saying, well hey, why can't we just have that apply to you know our reduced combat groups all the time and now it's a reality what i was always saying to that is that hey i mean steel phalanx were already one of the best factions in the game before limited insertion when they're only using a single combat group and now they're a whole lot better because you just can't reduce their border pools by two and i think that argument still stands but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that you're sort of shifting the middle a little bit towards these smaller groups because generally the consensus is that most good army lists have between 13 and 16 orders and sometimes uh, 20 order lists are really hard to deal with and you just don't see these single combat groups used very much, at least not where I'm, fr where I'm from. Having said that, now that they've brought this rule out, um, yeah, I'm going to give it a go. I've, I've already got a combined army list, which I used last season uh, in a couple of friendly games, and it did really, really well. 
despite losing the extra couple of orders because it was the uh, Nathematic, Overtron, Noctifer, uh, models like that which generally are just tough enough that you have a lot of orders uh, hanging around. Mnemonica uh, effectively means you've got 11 orders to spend because uh, your lieutenant's going around fighting. So I'm going to be doing a bit more of that. I'm going to make some combined army lists which have 10 orders and, and play them. So that's going to be cool. Closed battle lists. Uh, okay, so what does this say? In the present season, closed army lists are established as official, valid for the ITS. Different versions of army lists, the players can have options. I think this uh, only applies to Pan Oceana. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm not too sure how this applies to other factions. I don't think it does at this point, but correct me if I'm wrong, maybe we'll read on. Alive consequences. So you can't take alive anymore, but you can take bit and kissed in the combined army. So uh, that makes no sense whatsoever. But hey, uh, it's cover spell. Sometimes things don't make sense. The Alive team, uh, we all thought they were going to be given to one particular faction to use, and I could think of a few factions which really could have done with them, NCA being one of them. But I think they're also appropriate in Nomads. Nomads don't need them, but they feel appropriate there. Or Ariadna kind of helps them out a fair bit. But um, Combined Army, I, I don't really know the background or fluff behind these guys, but yeah. So Combined Army, I, I believe, couldn't take them to begin with, and now they can? Is that what's going on? Bit and Kiss, though, were a team that you really only took if you're going for the group as a whole to keep them um, as regular orders. I, I did use them in my, my games, but looking at this version of them, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think you get the picture with them. Um, Combined Army don't really have any killer hackers for using the fast ha um, panda through. Why hacking device is really lame, like it doesn't really uh, play a role in your list, doesn't really achieve anything. The stun light grenade launcher and adhesive launcher are situational and uh, are definitely not worth the, the points that you have to pay for them. And they're irregular, so like you're having to really just spend that order on them and they're not, not often going to be wanting to do anything in a turn when it's just them. So I, I think that's kind of stupid, I don't really think I'll be playing them at all in Combined Army. Uh, again, it's just, it seems nonsensical that that would have happened. Strike Zone Wotan Consequences. Now, I'm sure you guys all watched my video <laughs> about Strike Zone Wotan, and um, you know that I thought it was a pile of garbage. Um, you heard my reasons why. But now they're saying um, Pan Oceania has been declared virtual winner of the, uh, the Strike Zone Wotan conflict. Let's stop, let's hold it right there. <laughs> Oh god. Um, so Pan Oceania, they're the most popular faction. They are the Space Marines of Infinity. They have the most people playing them, and that's the reason why they were the winners. Um, so they get some sort of like tournament benefit. What that's doing is it's saying um, that all of the people who play Pan Oceania but didn't participate in Strikes on Wotan um, get some kind of benefit. And everybody else uh, who competed in Wotan who weren't Pan Oceania and the people who didn't compete as well get to have to sort of suffer this kind of little disparity. Um, now in, prim in, in principle that annoys me but once we find out what this reward actually is um, it's just laughable. It just becomes it becomes really comical because um, the closed battle as we'll see um, are kind of are kind of ridiculous. They're kind of kind of stupid anyway. Um, I just I just can't understand like, is it meant to be a reward? Is it a booby prize? Is it a joke? I I don't know. Um, I'm kind of dumbfounded by some of these changes. We'll talk about them more soon. I want to leave it there for now. Um, extras. Uh, spec Ops. Um, I'm going to skip Spec Ops. I don't feel like I'm qualified to talk about that because in my area we don't actually use Spec Ops. So um, that could be something for another day. Um, soldiers of uh, Limited Insertion. Okay, we know about that from the previous previous season. Um, Soldiers of Fortune. Okay, as far as I understand it, this is a this is an optional uh, caveat to your tournament where if everyone agrees, um, you show up and you go to the tournament and you can use mercenary troops. Um, that definitely benefits, say, Pan Oceania, who can't normally take smoke grenades, for example. Um, some of the mercenaries, I think, are pretty good. Some of them aren't. 
I haven't really analysed the mercenaries very much so far, so it's going to be hard for me to really comment on that. I know that McMara is a is a good one, and um, Avicenna is, is possibly one that you might take again. Panoceana can benefit from better Doctor. I think Pan, I think Pano is, probably is the faction that benefits the most. They've got low willpower, but will, um, some mercenaries have good willpower. Um, you know, they don't have smoke or impetuous stuff like that. So put McMara in there, really awesome. Saito Togan has that, um, your Jimbo, so factions that don't really have access to that kind of thing normally will probably want that. Um, I wouldn't really want to play any tournaments that really involve this though, because I think it would skew the balance a little bit too much. Escalation Tournament, not really into it. Uh, ITS rating, reporting results, okay, let's carry on. Classified objectives, so I think this is technically the same, a lot of this is just similar material to what we had before. Um... Still secure the HPT. Everything else is still in here. Um, it's just really that um, that swap out now. We've got kidnapping, so you've got to be in Sivivac state with the enemy HPT at the end of the game. Cool. All right, let's come to the closed battle lists. Uh, fun, fun, fun. So as a reward for um, for winning the Strike Zone Wotan campaign, that wasn't really even a competition. Um, Pan Oceania allowed to go to tournaments with some special lists, um, and these special lists that they can can use are weaker than lists that you could build using Army Builder normally. So let's say you are a vanilla player, well you can take a Yotam, and you can take the Fusiliers, um, you can take a Nis, whatever, you can take the Doctor and the CSU, well you can't take the CSU, but you can take something as good as the CSU. Um, all you're really gaining by restricting yourself to this 10 order list uh, and taking some really subpar models in some cases is having a Haris team of, 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 of Nis. And uh, I think this is really rubbish because you've got no smoke obviously and the Nis as a Haris, well they're kind of good defensively but you give up so much to have that. The Yotam is probably my favourite tag and he's best in the defensive role but this list in general is too defensive. You've got nothing that's particularly fast, apart from maybe the tag, if you want to commit him and get him killed. You've got nothing that can infiltrate. You've got a good specialist here in the form of the Knight Hospitalia, but after that dies, then what else is really going to be pressing the buttons? Maybe the Fusiliers, with their Whip 12 from the deployment zone? Don't really like it. Um, it's a very predictable list, has no closed information. Um, I'm just going to write this off now and say that um, if I was Pano, I wouldn't play this list. If I was a regular Pano player that could take things like the Crocman, the Bulleteer, uh, the Akali, or, or whatever, the, the Swiss Guard, just wouldn't take it. Then we come to the next one. Um, this one gets a little bit more interesting because it's got Saito Tagan. So it's the first time that Pano get to experience smoke. Um, and they can combo the smoke with their, their Nis Link team. So that's cool. I mean, if the enemy's got something just standing out there for you to shoot, you throw the smoke from the midfield, revealing Saito, by the way, and then the Nist comes up with his HMG and just blasts you. I feel, though, that, like, couldn't it just blast you anyway? Like, that's Blissical 13, MSV2 with five dice. Do you even need smoke for that? No, I don't really feel like you need it. Um, smoke, smoke is a good rule, but you're talking about factions that have impetuous smoke that's basically free and smoke can be everywhere and smoke's very good defensively because good fizz and you don't really lose you know the closed information of your ninja by doing that uh, and you just advance all around the field if Saito is throwing a grenade and you're moving a guy up to the objective it's just not very cost effective Saito is not a specialist um, Svorza is not a specialist as far as I can see you've got um, the Fusiliers none of them are specialists uh, so the killer hack and this is the only thing that can move up and press buttons and it's 4-2 speed. I mean it's cool, it's, it's killer hacker, but where are the repeaters? It's, I mean it's not, it's not, doesn't have marker state for surprise attack or anything. I mean this, this list is rubbish. You've got a core of three fusiliers and a Haris of three Nis, But you've got a, a group with eight regular orders and one irregular. Ugh! Like, ugh, that's really bad. Um, let's go to the next one. In this one, you can make a Reese team with the uh, the Sergeant Hara, Hacker and the, the Hospitalia. So that's kind of cool. Um, do any of these guys have the... Oh, yeah, so you've got the Special Sergeant with Infiltration. So this is probably the best of them because it's got a little um, Infiltrator. 
but it's got nine orders. Like seriously, I know we can't reduce the number of orders with the command token because of the new rules, but I'm not really feeling it. I mean, what what models the Rambo here? You haven't got a you haven't got a Bulleteer, haven't got a like an Akali or a um, or a Crusader Brethren or anything like that. You run the Jotun around the field. You run out of orders. It could potentially get hacked, get out of position. Um, yeah, I mean, your one special sergeant is good at pressing buttons, but you're kind of reliant on him. As soon as he goes down, then that's a problem. The Knight Hospitaller Doctor is, is, is decent. Like, I give people that. But at the end of the day, he's 4-4 starts in deployment zone, and he's got a multi-rifle, and that is it. It's probably one of the better lists of the, of the ones we've looked at so far, but it's still terrible. Uh, and then finally, list D. Okay, this is looking better. We've got, uh, okay, we've got a Sierra drone bot with an HMG. That's a total reaction bot. Do we have a regular hacking device? No, killer hacker. There's the Fusely, I have one. No, so you can't put assisted fire on them. I feel like it's a waste to have combat robots without the ability to assisted fire. Is there an engineer to repair him when he inevitably dies? Um, not seeing one. No, okay. Uh, so the Fusely is going to be in a core. Awesome. But um, the Nists are in a Harris as well. Got the Pathfinder there. It's nice. This is probably this is probably the best of the four, but it's still junk. Like it's st still not worth taking over. I mean, you you don't get enough of a benefit from the Nists Harris to make up for the fact that you could take a more well-rounded regular list from the Pano like roster. Ugh. Ugh. Alright, uh, scenarios, let's run through them. So, Annihilation uh, is more or less the same in terms of the structure here, but the difference is that there's no longer the two-point classified you can get, you kill the enemy data tracker, so it's a more about annihilating things than it was before. As you guys saw from my previous Annihilation video, I said that um, it almost was like slightly classified, it should be the name. It's more important to get the classified and deny it to your opponent sometimes than it is to kill stuff because it's so easy to get a draw otherwise. But now, you can focus on killing the enemy data tracker and while you're doing that, you're killing other things. So this becomes a bit more of a clean mission. I'm looking forward to playing it more often. And uh, again, uh, it's great to take a model in your army that is very resilient, that um, could survive against a, you know, a Rambo coming around and killing it like a drop trooper. So if it's like uh, corroded with Sepsator and Plasma rifle or something like that, uh, then it's going to be uh, really easy to keep alive. And also, the Corrontid's worth so many points, it's a double whammy, because if you keep that alive, your opponent has just um, failed to kill so many, uh, a, such a big chunk of points. Uh, any other special rules? So no retreat, we had that from before. The data tracker, we know about that. There's no HVT model. So you can't substitute uh, the data tracker um, uh, component of the scenario for the HPT. So that's that's gone, and I like that. I, I like that they've removed that for this mission. Biotech Vor. Uh, we were talking about this in our club recently, and we are yet to play this mission, but I'm looking forward to it. I did a lot of thinking about it in the last week, and I feel like Biotech Vor is a mission that benefits. Uh, armies that have a lot of impetuous, especially impetuous with smoke. So if you've got the Shaolin monks or the Gazimotiwa or the Dacharatsai, they all move forward, they throw the smoke and all your other impetuous stuff moves forward, then the rest of your army has an easier time getting into that zone, especially if those models provided regular orders, which is why Dacharatsai are really quite good there. So I think I really would favor combined army, um, especially with a mnemonic lieutenant who can use the lieutenant order to move into the middle out of the deployment zone really good strategy there but if you're playing pano for example where you've got no impetuous you're having to coordinate stuff in and move through you're having to rely on your link team uh toha are also good because they could use the makuls to impetuous forward with eclipse grenades but then they've got the triads to move move out as well very efficiently uh generally this scenario seems like it has remained intact since the last season i can't see too much that's that's different if anything I, I I can't be bothered checking the other uh, PDF just to see whether the the tiers are any different. But yeah, uh, this clue two classified, so I think it's pretty much the same as it was before. Let's go to the next one, quadrant control. So the change here is that you get a bonus point if you have your data tractor data tractor <laughs> data tracker helping to dominate one of the quadrants at the end of the game round. 
So this is still very much a player who goes second is the player who wins sort of mission. Uh, the data tracker just helps compound that a little bit more. Uh, I think I think the data tracker can help break a tie also. Let's say you have a game where in the first game round, uh, player one has secured the, the quadrants, has got a data tracker in there, and then there's a draw for the second game round, and then in the third game round, the other player secures the quadrant, but maybe throughout the game, um, one of the players tipped it over the edge with their data tracker dominating uh, when they were the ones securing the quadrant and the other player didn't manage to get the data tracker in there. Uh, again, it, it's it's quite good for models like the Sujian, who can who's already too powerful, can already sort of move out, go on top of a building with climbing plus, just goes go prone there and, and dominate that objective. And if he's the data tracker, then all the better. So I don't particularly like this mission, especially with Intel Com being there as well. Uh, unless I've read it incorrectly, uh, support and control mode says you can add the value of the card to your zone of control of operations. Which I think is really, really stupid because the cards are randomly generated and some cards have a, a high value and some have a low value. So if you're lucky enough to get a card with like 35 points on it and your opponent's unlucky to get like 5 or 10 point card, then you can play more or less evenly getting a similar number of points into a zone to contest, but you tip it over the edge because you drew a higher card. I think that is really whack. So I wish they would fix that shit. It's terrible. Um, decapitation. So this is a holdover from the previous pack. And uh, more army points, you get two. More lieutenants, you get three. Uh, you kill their designated target, you get two. You kill that target with your data tracker, you get three. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Let's say you manage to kill their target with your data tracker and you get away with your data tracker then the best they can hope for is a draw unless they do the same to you. However, they might be going after your de designated target um, with even a model that's not the data tracker. The thing is, if you go first and you move out and you kill their designated target because it was in a terrible area with your data tracker and you get that done, you run away with your data tracker to safety and uh, maybe with your other combat group, if you've got one, you go and synchronize your HVT and you bring it to safety and for the rest of get the game, your opponent just has to contend himself with just trying to kill more points. And if they don't kill the lieutenant, well, it's a 5-2 victory to you. So bear that kind of strategy in mind. Uh, again, I think it's really important to create situations with the, the table out where both players have somewhere adequate to put their data tracker where they can defend it. I think that's quite crucial. No classified objectives, yay! So I think for that alone, I'm definitely going to be playing this mission a fair bit. Um, that is an improvement, which is good. Reinforced tactical link, so obviously lieutenants uh, are always public and they just um, they, they swap around. They, you don't go to lost lieutenant, that's a holdover from the previous pack. Um, yeah, no good mission. I think that's 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 an improvement. Show of force. What's different about this one? Okay, so again, kill the enemy data tracker. Uh, this is uh, not like the previous mission we just read, because you don't actually have to do anything with your data tracker, as far as I can tell. You just have to keep it alive. So you want to put your data tracker on something that's not going to be fighting too much and not is not going to be dying. Maybe your lieutenant, for example, because you're going to be keeping that safe at all costs. This is still very much a uh, like a final turn, uh, you know, adv advantage mission. If you've got a tag and you just walk them over there and just hang out in the objective at the end, so that gives you half of the potential objective points. So if you've managed in the early game to kill that data tracker and you kept yours alive, you don't even need to worry about the army points because it'll it'll come down to what happens with the transmission antenna. Having said that, I do like the changes to this mission because it means that when you go first you can try and focus your game plan on killing more stuff, killing the data tracker, keeping your data tracker alive, and if you've done all of that, you might be able to block their tag from getting to the objective at the end by setting up a lot of arrows, like they can't go over there unless they go through a whole bunch of sniper rifles or a missile launcher, or within range of a repeater and there's a, a hacking program around. Or if you, in the early game, kill their tag and you kill their data tracker, and you escape with your data tracker, then they can't control the transmission antenna with their tag, so that will set up a win for you. So 
all things considered, this is actually a pretty good mission for both first turn and second turn, so I quite like the improvements, that's really good. The panoplies have no effect on the mission objectives, but if you've got a spare couple of orders, you may as well grab something from the panoplies, because they can be quite good. But it is a bit luck based. So yeah, I don't really, yeah, I, I think they, would, they maybe um, didn't feel like getting rid of the panoplies. Uh, it's a bit superfluous, it's a bit of extra noise in the mission, but there you go. Panel, please. Looting and sabotaging. So this is one where you've got this uh, objective here in, in your deployment zone, and they've got one there. It's a bit a bit similar to capture and protect uh, layout, but there's an AC2 or whatever it's called, um, an advanced communication console. And to destroy it, you need to get over there with uh, something in close combat that has the anti-material trait. It says an AC2 can only be damaged by CC attacks with the CC weapons possessing the anti-material trait. Now when I think of that, I straight away think of the specular killer with a monofilament weapon, or a FIDE with a double action close combat weapon, because unless I'm mistaken, those are anti-material. In fact, I might just double check that one. We're just gonna have a little look at the rules for a second. I'd hate to be, be wrong, because I know how much you guys love pointing it out when I'm wrong. Equipment. Um, weaponry. Monofilament. Is that actually... Oh, here it is. 112. Let's go have a look. Won't be long, guys. Let's have a look. I'm pretty sure it does. So, monofilament weapon. Um... Fixed value, kills directly, it's exotic, huh, okay, maybe it doesn't, we'll have to, I'll have to keep looking, um, there's double action over here, so double action says, oh, I, th I think, I think where we find it is not in the actual rule book, but on, on the army profiles, right? So if I go to lists and I go and pick uh, a list that actually has uh, something with, with anti-material, something with Shinobu in it, or even a Samaritan list, because that's he's got a Vorpal close combat weapon, right? So Vorpal close combat weapon is monofilament, throwing weapon CC, no, fair enough. And uh, is there anything with double action? Okay. I know I know for a fact that double action close cap combat weapons do. Okay? So uh, I'm pretty sure the FIDE can take a double action a double action close combat weapon or something like that. So an impersonator that starts right next to it can probably do it. Either way, um, you could even just get an infiltrator going out halfway along your deployment zone uh, to the table, I mean, and then sort of walk over there and mark a state and then, then, then whack it and destroy it that way. I just thought that the monofilament uh, weapon would be the way to do it, just given that it's... Um, got three structure points but yeah I mean if you've got if you've got something with martial arts level four two swings it's got to make four armor saves armor eight's pretty massive but that's that's why it's uh, that's why I felt it was important for me to find out whether the, the monofilament had it because I thought that hey the monofilament weapon uh, might get rid of it automatically okay so more research required here sorry guys holding up the video but um, we'll figure that later at any rate, um, there you get most of the points, I believe, from destroying your opponent's AC2. Let's have a look. So you get a point for every bit of damage you did to it, and then destroying it, you get another one. So if you wipe the whole thing out, that's that's a massive amount. I don't know what to think about this. I mean, it's it's going to depend on on what models can destroy it. The panoplies have a very small effect on the mission. There's one classified, so that's not too important. But again, this is not a bad mission for going first because it doesn't matter when you destroy the objective. So, like, if you've got the last turn going over in there and killing it's not really going to make too much difference if your opponent's already killed yours, right? That's that's basically just a way of drawing it up, evening it up, so you can't get any 
advantage just by going second. So I don't mind it. I think, I mean, generally in Infinity, going second uh, has some inherent advantages which aren't even baked into the mission, right? You get to be the one attacking without having your opponent following up and killing your, your models when they're out of position. So just purely because of that, there you go. Um, tags have anti-materials, so tags, again, if you don't have access to anything else that can get the job done, then the tag killing it's great. But again, I'm not too sure what counts as anti-material for these purposes. I mean, if, if explosive counts as anti-material, which I assume that it would, then Achilles, you know, um, your Jimbo, I think, has got double action. How do you tell whether it's anti-material or not? I kind of want to know. Anti-materials, weapons, special ammunition can affect structures and keepers, material, uh, scenery. Okay. Let's just have a look through some of the weapons just to see. So these, this is ammunition that I'm having a look at. Armor piercing, doesn't say anything. Double action. Two separate armor rolls. So because it doesn't mention anything, I'm going to assume that uh, it's somewhere in the weapons profiles. Let's just have a look. Here we go here. Another, um, so D charge is anti-material. So you can go over there with a D charge and blow it up. So that's, that's, that's actually quite a good way of killing it. DACC weapon says anti-material right there. So there you go, DA. Uh, what about explosive? Explosive CC weapon is anti-material, so Achilles, um, pretty good at it because he can attack it twice and um, it's going to have to take so many armor saves against his high fizz that it's going to fail some of them, so he's a pretty good model for that. What about um, K1, so that's anti-material, K1 rifles, actually pretty good. This actually um, finally makes K1 sniper rifles actually a little bit better because uh, you can just shoot the objective with it. Actually, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't because it has to be close combat. Ugh. Okay, so K1 cut sniper rifle still very, very bad. <laughs> Monofilament CC weapon does not have anti-material. There you go. Okay, so we can't do it that way. So it's going to have to be something else. What about viral? Does viral have it? Um, I don't think that's actually in this rulebook set. Anyway, let's move on. I think we've said a fair bit about this already. Yeah data tracker does the data tracker even come into i noticed they put the data tracker rules into every bit okay so you can destroy the enemy ac2 with your data tracker for a more an extra bonus point so again achilles make him your data tracker there's no uh penalty for losing your data tracker in this mission it's nothing to do with army points so you may as well make your biggest heaviest hitter in close combat the data tracker that's how you'd, you'd go on this mission and that's that's fine i look forward to giving this mission a go it seems pretty cool Frontline. Here is a bad mission, and it uh, it was bad in the last in the last uh, season, and it's still bad just because it's effectively the same. Uh, there's now a way to get a bonus point for having the data tracker there, so he's he's there to break a tie. But the horrible thing about this mission is that if you're the person going second, you stall out the game. You keep as much stuff as live as you can, rely heavily on marker state stuff, and then when it's the final turn of the game. You simply look at the table and you go, right, does my opponent have more stuff in their deployment zone section, between the deployment zone in the middle, or do they have more stuff in the center? And once you've figured out which zone has less stuff in it, you shunt all of your models that you can into the one they have the least stuff in, and you win that way. Uh, you can bring in airborne deployment troopers at the side of the table, your marker state stuff comes out of hidden deployment and it just goes there, that's fine. Um, you can bring the data tracker along if you can afford it, but if not, you're still going to win. And that's it. Uh, obviously, it is possible to win by going first if you just crush them and you just kill everything, but against an a opponent of equal skill or better, you're not really going to do that. Your opponent's going to be cagey with where they keep the stuff, they can hide things, they can use hidden deployment, marker state, um, they can use some cheap AROs to help protect, and jammers, example from Hark Islam, how are you going to do that? Just a really crappy mission. I'm, I'm I'm annoyed that they would keep this in mission in, in here, but they'd get rid of a good mission like Engineering Deck. Firefight. This was always a great mission. Um, I liked that it was more about Annihilation than Annihilation actually was, and I think that's still the case. It's, it's very much a mission that you're unlikely to get a draw on, because mathematically, 
you're always going to have one person get with more army points, unless it's a dead even draw and you've both killed exactly the same number of, uh, of points worth of stuff. Uh, so three points more army points, uh, lieutenants, bonus, specialist uh, troops, well that's going to be uh, one that comes up fairly often. So you'll see a lot of four to zero, sort of well, a margin of four uh, in these cases. More items to the panoplies, that's a good tiebreaker, but you don't really need to prioritize that and killing the enemy data tracker again. Let me put it this way, if you've killed more army points than they have, but they've picked up everything else, it's a 5-3 win to them, but that's going to come up very, very infrequently. You've got the classified objectives as well, so let, let's imagine you've killed more army points and you've killed more specialists, you've got four, and they've got both classifieds, panoplies, and they've got the data tracker, then it's kind of a draw there. More often than not, though, the player who does kill more army points is going to win, but they have to be a little bit careful, I guess. Generally, if, you've got, if you're winning on attrition, you're going to be able to uh, even up the game on Panoplies and Data Tracker on the last turn most of the time. I like it, though. It's still got the little uh, thing that makes airborne de uh, deployment a lot better, coming around the sides and stuff like that, and the plus three bonus for landing. So I'll be playing heaps of Firefight. I, I think it's an improvement over the previous Firefight. It's, uh, it's actually pretty cool. And the Data Tracker um, is in there, but acts as a, another way to sort of get an extra point. It's not too game-breaking. I like the fact that the data tracker isn't as essential as it is in some of the other missions where the data tracker is a little bit too important. So there's that. Deadly Dance. Um, I never particularly liked this mission uh, for the fact that the quadrants are randomized. If it wasn't for that, this would actually be a very, very good mission. And it's the kind of mission that uh, does encourage a tag. Like, this is a mission where you want to crank out your Ulan or your Sphinx or something like that because you get uh, that bonus point which can easily make you run away with the game really with the scoreboard. Killing the enemy data tracker allows you to sort of hold on to the game and stall it out and not let either player get ahead on the quadrants but win because you assassinated their data tracker and you kept yours alive. So I do like the fact that you can win without having to focus solely on the quadrants so that's an improvement. But again, there's two things wrong with this mission. The quadrants are random, so potentially you can have both of the quadrants that you're going for on your, your half of the table, and your opponent has to cross their half of the table just to get to the, the quadrants that you're both going for. Not fair. And second thing is that um, using your specialist to go onto one of the consoles to try and move the enemy uh, quadrant uh, is also random. If you're going to that length and you're making that effort, you've earned the opportunity to move the quadrant to uh, a place that's more beneficial for you rather than it being randomized, is my thoughts on it. The only time you'd, you'd, you'd try and go for that is if, you know, it couldn't get any worse. Your opponent's already got your quadrant, sorry, the, uh, qu the quadrant's already on the other side of the table and you need to move it onto your side of the table, so that's when you crank that out. Supremacy was... Um, was a decent mission in the previous season. I liked it because uh, it was often quite hard to win purely on the quadrant and sometimes you could make up for being behind on the quadrants and not having second turn by capturing more consoles and then blowing them up. Um, but it's the same. I don't even think the data tracker has any effect on this mission unless I'm misreading something. They still have the Intelcom thing for getting rid of uh, the specialist uh, effect especially with hacking at the end of the game for you know being the supreme owner of the consoles um yeah again this is a mission where you still want to go second and uh, just focus on getting that that buffer of two points ahead of your opponent and just leaving it that way like if you're if you're just going to secure that on one game round and and, and draw it up on the other two game rounds and you both get your classified for example and that evens it up also you can more easily get and secure the HVT by going over there in the last turn. Uh, and hacking consoles, it's pretty easy to just draw it up that way. I mean, it's unlikely your opponent will get two and prevent you from getting two. That's not going to come up too much. And even then, they've only got a draw. So I don't love it. Um, safe area. This is another mission that has been played, but it's more it's more like supremacy, but um, taking effect at the end of the game, right? So dominate more sections than the, the adversary. At the end of the game, you get four objective points, and that's usually going to seal it. Uh, so very rarely is your opponent going to win when you achieve, achieve that objective. What they could do is they could control more consoles, but to do that, don't they actually have to have a specialist next to it? So I can't really imagine 
a situation where you actually have more models in three out of four of the zones, or you have two and they have one, or you have one and they have zero, and yet somehow they actually have models next to all the consoles, that's not really conceivable. So this is again a mission where you go second. Um, having the data tracker dominate a section at the end of the game gives you one bonus point, but it's not a huge effect. I like that the data tracker's in there yet again. Like that that's again a good thing and again benefits those models which aren't markers, which have a lot of wounds, can go and hide somewhere. Sujian, Karontid benefits those models, whereas say um, like I think Ariadna, um, I can't really think of a really suitable model which is as, is as good as like the Sujiana or whatever it is because they've got a lot of irregular stuff, a lot of marker state stuff. Um, and again, um, Toha, this benefits Toha, I mean, the rich get richer, you guys know what it's like, I mean they can put symbiomates in their data tracker and so forth. Yeah, symbiomates, can't believe it. Transmission Matrix, uh, from what I read of this it's very similar to the previous uh, Transmission Matrix but with the added designated target where you can also go and kill a designated target with your data tracker and you don't have to worry about losing your data tracker so it's it's possible to win this game by just keeping your opponent from getting too many points in the transmission areas while assassinating that that designated target so it's another way to win and uh, this is something I've been advocating for a long period of time. A lot of these missions are now creating two paths to victory, which is a good thing. It encourages more thoughtful infinity and more exciting and interesting games, uh, less predictable strategies. And you may change from plan A to plan B partway through the game, and that makes it more cinematic, more exciting, so I like that. One thing that intrigues me about this mission is that you don't really want to use a hackable model as your data tracker because it's going to get in range of that transmission area. Your opponent's going to want to put their designated target within one of those repeater bubbles. So if Achilles is heading over there to, to go on and do that, you may have like one or two assault hackers hanging around and that's going to ruin his day. So it makes it a bit uh, more preferable to go with something like um, Shishkin where Shishkin is really fast, she's quite tough, and she's very good at killing designated targets, and she can't be hacked, so that would be my strategy with Combined Army for this mission. Or just have a lot of killer hackers if I'm playing like Nomads or whatever, and just kill the hackers first as I'm moving out my model to go and, and wreck them with, but again, um, Nomads don't have any particularly fast models which are suitable to, the, suitable to be the data tracker in this mission. You wouldn't want to use your tag because he can be possessed through the, uh, the repeater. Although having said that, couldn't you couldn't you use your killer hackers to kill their their assault hacker first? Depends on whether you have the balls to to, to um, go ahead with that plan, I suppose. Power pack, I believe, was something from Strike Zone Wotan. Um, so you connect more antennas and control more consoles than your opponent at the end of the game and the board looks like this, but you're deployed in these little corners unless you have four deployment level one or two. And there's a saturation zone. Saturation zones um, have always been good for things like uh, knocked fire missile launchers or intruder snipers, things which only get one shot anyway and want to avoid getting overwhelmed by HMGs. So that is something which you'll see in this mission like you do in all missions that have big um, fat saturation zones right through the middle. But it does look like um, a second player going second wins the game in most cases because really you want to wait until it's time for the end of the game, you've got the last turn of the game, you go over there and you simply do the needful. Like if, if they've got models trying to control consoles or whatever, you can kill them in the last turn because they're just sitting there, they're sitting ducks, so you go out and kill them and then you simply move your model out of hidden deployment and take back the antenna or control the console, so it's a, it's a second turn win kind of, kind of mission all things considered. Chain of Command gets a plus three, you don't see Chain of Command all that much, so it's good that that's there, but not every faction has Chain of Command, so yeah, I find that a little bit, um, find it a little bit lame. Capture and Protect. Now, one thing I find really interesting about this mission is they've removed the console, so no longer do you have to unlock the beacon. So that's changed. Um, I think that's kind of cool. Um, unlocking the beacon is something that meant that you generally wanted to, to wait until the end of the game to secure it. Now what you can do is deploy next to the beacon, put an eclipse grenade there or a smoke grenade there if they don't have any MSV2 and then just run away with it provided they've got no mines or crazy koalas or whatever. So again it's a good mission to take the crazy koalas and the mines and, and their mad traps on 
Um, it's good to have a little bit of hidden deployment, uh, get, getting ready to, to, to defend. TR bots aren't too bad because they can cover your beacon without you know covering the enemy deployment zone, so they stay alive a bit better. But um, your data tracker, if it captures the, the beacon, gets more points. So again, I'm thinking in some cases your opponent's going to be dumb enough to let you run away with, with it just by using like a feeder or whatever, which can't be the data tracker apparently. But in a lot of cases, I think it's better to just go second because you can walk over there and capture it and not have to move very far because you can get ahead on points that way. Also, if they've captured yours in their last turn, you've got a turn to go and kill the model carrying it. So that makes second turn quite good. Yeah, so that that's probably going to be my approach to this mission. Um, there could be a lot of draws. There could be a lot of draws where both player gets classified and neither player gets a beacon. And um, the thing about the previous version of this mission is that sometimes you could win by taking a, a console and preventing your opponent from getting their one because you defended it so well. You'd taken first turn, you got their console, and then you just completely lock the other one down and they, they uh, are unsuccessful in getting over there because they fail whip checks or whatever. So I, th I feel like this mission might have been weakened a little bit actually. Um, I, I don't like it as much. Uh, just by looking at it, maybe my opinion will change after playing it. Tic-tac-toe! Um, so this is a mission which came out in HSN3. Um, I played it a few times. It's kind of funky. Uh, you're making little um, uh, rows of connected antennas. But again, it's much easier to do if you're going second. You know, if your opponent in their last turn connects an antenna in your half of the table, cool, you get it back again. And then you send a model over there that w which was in hidden deployment and you collect one of theirs after putting a smoke grenade down on it, right? So Imperial Service, lob the ever-reliable burst two ballistic skill 14 grenade launcher with smoke grenades and then move out your ninja and you get the console and that's it don't really like the mission yeah uh the grid uh, play this in tagline um this one's interesting you can't kill the antennas until after the first round it's about how many you designate uh and then you destroy them after designating you have to just designate it first before destroying them and you can use a opposite forward observing just to designate a bunch of them at a time instead of pressing the button so i think by far the best strategy is to take first turn if you can get it um forward observe a whole bunch of um of of consoles in your second turn and then destroy them so what you want to do is set up a anomalous which has some really good forward observing capability in list one I would recommend like something like a, um, a Dazju Ford Observer or a Spectre or whatever. Ford Observes the, the crap out of these objectives and then with your other um, with your other combat group you start shooting at those ones with your sniper rifle intruder or whatever and you kill them quite easily. And then your opponent uh, is on the back foot there because they've got to try and catch up with you and uh, potentially you can kill, you can get you can get more kills on the on the antennas more quickly than they can because you are a step in the head in terms of tempo, in terms of the way the game is going. Um, killing des designated targets with your data tracker again is a whole bunch of points, only four up for grabs. So I don't think that's going to make up for having destroyed more antennas. Uh, there's no classifieds there, so you get three objective, three for the antennas there. And I think you get some bonus ones for having designated them. So if you get the full six from designating more and destroying more, which is usually going to come hand in hand, then you're going to win. Your opponent can't really catch up just by killing the designated target. So this is like a first turn win, I reckon. Because neither player can kill them in the first game round. And in the second game round, it doesn't really matter, you know, what designating work you did to begin with. Well, I guess it does matter because your opponent has to do more work. Well, you have to do more work if they weren't already designated. So there's a bit of a, a race initially. So you may as well do that if you're not shooting your opponent. But, I mean, what I what I would even consider doing is going and killing their, their target with the data tracker in the first round. And then just killing the designating and then killing the, the, the antennas in the second round. But I would definitely take first turn if I win the lieutenant role in this particular mission, for sure. It's also um, another interesting factoid that, let's say you're playing Steel Phalanx or something like that, and you're playing a ten order, order list, well you can't have the two two orders cut from, with the command token in that, in that context, and then you go out and do your thing that you normally do. 
be, yeah, so remember they've got two structure points, so they can be a little bit tough to crack, but usually pumping two shots into it with a sniper rifle that's hitting on 16s will do the job. Com Center, this is one of my favorite missions in ITS in general, and I think that it's actually become a little bit better. So one way to win is just to connect more antennas than your opponent and go second and complete it at the end of the game, but you only get four points. Now what you can do is kill more specialists and kill their designated target with your data tracker, which is pretty easy to do, and you've got five points, and if you both get your classified, then you have won the game without connecting a single antenna, provided that you stay ahead in specialist kill, uh, kills, you keep your designated, designated target safe, and you kill their one. So time will tell. How easy is it going to be to keep yours safe and kill theirs if you have the first turn, for example? I think it will be quite achievable with some army lists, because you have got one dedicated combat group which moves out, secures your HVT, pulls back, let's say you're playing in Imperial Service, super easy with smoke there, then your second combat group, well, you move something out with Marker State, um, you kill the designated target that way, but it can't be the data tracker, so uh, maybe... Um, just a really fast model like a Sujian, something that's survivable, you know, um, something like a Rushi uh, d data tracker, which, well, they can't be a remote, hang on. A CN Warrior can be the data tracker. So you put the smoke down, you move them out there, you blast the designated target. The designated target, I think, still has to take AROs as normal, so you could probably use the zone of control smoke shenanigan. And then after you've done that, well, you've got your three points there, you just have to kill one specialist trooper and keep yours alive, which is not too hard. So going first is not a bad idea at all anymore in this mission. So I'm, I'm liking that there are some ITS missions which uh, benefit going first. That is cool. It's a bit hit and miss though, some of these missions suck, some of them are good. Rescue is a mission which I played a few times in the previous season. So, at first glance, it looks pretty much unchanged. The data tracker does make a little bit of a difference, though. Have one civilian and civ evac set with the player's data tracker in the player's own dead zone at the end of the game. One bonus point. Cool. So, and it's two points if you get in the deployment zone. So, if you're going to make a last-minute smash and grab for it, may as well use the data tracker, right? So, I guess you're... If you're going for the extra points, you're kind of telegraphing to your opponent which model you're planning on using to do that work with. But even if your opponent knows, I don't think that's really going to have any impact on their ability to stop you. Either they're going to be able to do it or they're not. Um, I think it's kind of interesting, though. It adds a little bit of a, a le extra level of thought. Um, I still prefer going second in this mission because, once again, you can kill the enemy model that has evac one of your civilians in, in your last turn and grab their one at the same time, whereas if you are playing and you have the penultimate turn, you know, you've got more work to do. So, again, second turn is, is a benefit in this one in most cases. Exclusion zone, yep, fair enough. Um, saturation zone and difficult terrain zone, so again, uh, can be a bit easy to defend, but that's a good thing. You kind of want that in this kind of mission. Highly classified sucks! Socks, socks. Highly classified is just a bad mission because um, the objectives are randomized and some factions are, are better at uh, completing it than others. I mean, you look at Imperial Service, cool. So your Quangshi uses Biolocator to go un unconscious uh, with one order and then your Sophitech revives him straight away and, he's, uh, and that's that accomplished there and then. Or if you fail it, use it again on another guy. Sujian, excellent at going out and killing things like their specialists, and if it dies, it doesn't leave a corpse, so it can't be killed with, um, can't, can't be used to pick up um, extreme prejudice, stuff like that. Tohar, um, kind of awkward um, in terms of getting the engineering classified, test run. I hate this mission, it's just badly designed, they should have got rid of it. Supplies is a little bit more interesting. Supplies doesn't seem to use the data tracker. I think it's the same as it was before. Doctors are better at picking up the boxes. A lot of people believe that um, going first is, is an advantage because if you can throw smoke onto the, the boxes and then crack them out and run away with two of them, which is very doable if you've got 18 orders to start off with, then that's game. Um, your opponent, even if they have the very last turn, they're going to have to go all the way into your deployment zone which may be protected with, you know, hidden deployment troopers or mines or, or crazy koalas or whatever you've got. And that's it. So if I'm playing, if 
I'm playing Yu Ching, you know, get the smoke grenades up there, get the ninjas, crack out the boxes, move them back over. I've got two control groups to do that. And then maybe I've got some mad traps or something or some mines being laid around to help me defend. Easy as, as can be. And, and again, it just, um, it drives home the fact that uh, Pan Oceana are a weaker faction because they cannot achieve something like that. So again, this, so this mission is better for some factions than others because of the whole smoke thing like Onyx doesn't have smoke, for example, and it's also better for um, factions that have uh, infiltrating specialists in hidden deployment and so forth, uh, that are very good or high willpower, and going sec and going first is much better than second turn, so again, for those reasons, I just don't like this mission. Acquisition, so for each activated communication antenna, each control one at the end of the game, control the tech coffin at the end of the game, control it with the data track at the end of the game, so this is this is going second uh, will win most often because if you are going first you've got to leave some stuff out there you've got to leave the buttons turned on you've got to put the guys next to the consoles and if your opponent has anything surviving it's going to be easier for them to shoot your guys in the active turn and then just replace your models with their models next to those objectives and they can look at which which objectives in particular are going to provide the points needed to win they can, in some cases, you might look at this antenna and there's a big building between the tech coffin and the antenna and they've got this one, like, locked up because there's a tag there or whatever. But you can just pick off the other two really easily. So going second gives you that luxurious advantage of just seeing the minimum that needs to be done and just achieving that. Whereas uh, the player going first has to account for the uh, a wide, broad range of eventualities and spread themselves too thin. So, just don't like this mission. Engineers and hackers get plus three for activating communications. Data tracker's rules are there uh, because you control the data coffin to get more points from him. Yeah, crappy mission. Um, hunting party haven't played this one. It looks interesting because a lot of your models uh, swap out their or g gain the ability to shoot immobilization guns at people. So you've got to hunt things down. Looks fun. Um, I'm not too sure how good this mission actually is. Um, you get points for connecting antennas, but most of the points come from um, hunting down enemy lieutenants. It's very similar to decapitation in the sense that the uh, lieutenants are always op open information and they can be bounced around. Uh, um, huh. So you can't place them as a marker. I'm not too sure whether you're allowed to become a marker, but either way, it's it's just it's going to be good to use a lieutenant that is resistant. I mean, you can have a lieutenant that has ODD, right? Like Achilles ODD as your lieutenant in this mission. It's going to be kind of hard to hit him, to tag him with something which can immobilize him, right? Um, yeah, there's, there's hacking, but I think you've got to use... I think you've got to use the little guns, don't you? No, maybe you don't. Let's have a read of it. Hunting mission. So, if they're immobilized. Considered hunted when they're in isolated immobilized state. So you can use Oblivion. The thing is, though, Achilles, with his willpower and um, with his BTS, if you put Fairy Dust up, um, they've got to get something over there or get a picture over there. So he's going to be quite resistant to that. So I think some armies and some models are going to have an easier time with it in this mission than others. So I'm looking forward to giving it a go at some point. I'm not that excited about, about it though. I don't really feel comfortable saying much more than that because uh, I might be completely wrong. Oh, okay. Pretty long video so far. So I think we'll, we'll call it uh, wraps there. I mean, this last few pages is just about leagues and escalation and so forth, which I don't really buy into. But overall... Um, I think that this season will be better than the previous season. I'm looking forward to using data trackers. I think CB have generally done a decent job. They haven't done a uh, good enough a job. They've still left in a lot of stuff which is kind of lame and crappy. And ITS has never been one of the better things about Infinity. The best things about Infinity are the, the models and the some of the basic core rules. And the, the factions are, are, are pretty cool also. But ITS has never been something which is something I brag about, you know, I, I don't talk to people who aren't Infinity players and say, oh, come and play Infinity because the organized play and the mission system's really good. No, I say come and play because the game's fun and um, the models are cool and you'll enjoy collecting them. Um, 
I don't really uh, I don't really like to brag about or even talk up the missions at all. The missions are getting better in some cases. Like there are some good missions here, and I think there's a higher proportion of good missions than there were before. Um, I also encourage people to try out my mission Tactical Window. Somebody messaged me on the forums and said, "Hey, are you planning on updating Tactical Window to involve the data tracker?" I think I will. I'll try and upload that pretty soon. Um, but yeah, just going through them, Annihilation, good mission, Biotech Vore, decent, but uh, skewed towards some factions, Quad Control, no, Decapitation, alright, Show of Force is okay, Looting Sabotaging is alright, Frontline, terrible, Fr Firefight is good, Deadly Dance, no, don't like it, Supremacy, yeah, 50-50 on it, it's, um, maybe I'll give it a 4 out of 10. Safe area, no, not really, Transmission Matrix, yeah, I like the new version of that. Power Pack, um, can't really comment, I haven't really pl played it. Capture Protect, um, not as good as it was before, but it's still a decent mission, just, um, you know, favours going second a bit more. Tic-Tac-Toe, nah. The Grid, nah. Com Center, yes, big thumbs up. Rescue, um, yeah, above average for these missions, you know, within the context of this lineup. Highly classified sucks. Supplies, not very good. Acquisition, eh, don't really love it. And Hunting Party, just not sure. So there's, there's a bit of a mix in there. Anyway, I'm looking forward to playing some games, hopefully with factions that are not Pan Oceania, and uh, posting some bat wraps of them soon. Catch you later.